So let's shift gears and let's talk about the underlying explanations for why there's any uh, premium at all. There's, there's over the years since I've been studying economics, the the two approaches that that fight against each other are the human capital model and the signaling model. Talk about what the differences between those two models are and which one you think has, if you can, more uh, weight than the other. Uh, sure. So the human capital model and the signaling model are both stories about how education successfully increases earnings. So they're not disagreeing about whether education actually raises earnings, rather disagreeing about why. Uh, the human capital story says that you go to school, they actually teach you a bunch of useful job skills, you then finish and the labor market rewards you because you now are able to do more stuff. The signaling model says, no, 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 that's not what's going on. What's going on is that people go to school, they don't actually learn a lot of useful stuff. However, the whole educational process filters out the, 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 the people who wouldn't have been very good workers. So people who are lower intelligence, lower in work ethic, lower in conformity, those people tend to not do very well in school. They drop out. They get bad grades. And that's why the labor market cares. It's not that the school actually transforms you from a good worker to a bad worker. It's that the, schooling, the school puts a little sticker on your head, you know, grade A student, grade B student, grade C student. Uh, you know, a, a very simple way of explaining it is think about two different ways to raise the price of a diamond. Uh, one way is by cutting it very beautifully so that it's, a one, it's actually a better diamond. Another way, though, is you put on that funny monocle thing and you look at it and you appraise it. These are both ways that you can raise the price of a diamond. So cutting the diamond can raise the price, but also a very credible appraisal can raise the price as well. And the human capital story basically says that school, that school takes these diamonds in the rough and it cuts them very nicely, and then that's why they're more valuable. And signaling says, no, 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 what's going on is students show up to school basically as well, as good as they're going to be. And then what the school does is it puts them, it makes it puts them through a bunch of tests, makes them jump through a lot of hoops, and then it certifies them and certifies their quality at the end. And that's why employers actually care. Now, of course, you know, no, you know, any sensible person will say, well, there's some truth in both stories. But the, so the real question is not, is it all human capital or is it all signaling? The question is, what's the balance? Uh, the general view among most active labor economists is that signaling is basically irrelevant. It's may, you know, maybe 5%, 10%. It's something that we can pretty much forget about. Uh, my view, though, is signaling is more like 80%. And that it's, a slight, most labor economists, it's a slight difference. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> most, most labor economists are, you know, are you know, ignoring a lot of relevant evidence or they're disqualifying a lot of evidence that seems to be very, very credible on very on strange methodological grounds. And I say, look, we should really, we should take a, take a fair, a, a different, a, a fair look at all the evidence. Don't just look at the kinds of evidence that economists cite. Look at what's going on in educational psychology. Look at what's going on in sociology. And of course, also remember what school was like. You know, everyone that's talking about these issues spent well over ten years in school. So, you know, like, you know, does the human capital story actually even fit with your own experience? Uh, what I've generally found is when I argue with with uh, mainstream labor economists face to face. They make a lot of concessions that, yeah, the, yeah, I mean, signaling does fit everything I saw, but it can't really be. There's something has to be something misleading about everything that I ever experienced. And I say, well, why don't we just take what you experience more seriously and think about whether the evidence that you have actually is even inconsistent with the signaling model? Because I don't think it is. So let me push back a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. I've always been troubled by the signaling model. And I and I agree with you. I, it's it's an interesting uh, the sociology of labor economists is a fascinating thing because I agree with you. I think most labor economists don't like the signaling model and would be prone, as I am, to dismiss some evidence in favor of it. So I'm going to let you make the case in a second. But let me mm -hmm. let the listeners understand why I have a natural skepticism about it. And I think a lot of other labor economists do as well. And the reason is is that it's extremely expensive signal. So you're saying that well. For four years, I give up the chance to work. I pay this tuition, whether it's five thousand or ten or thirty or forty at a, at a private university, and at the for that enormous amount of money, I prove that I'm a good worker and I get the sticker on my head. Wouldn't there be an easier, cheaper way to get the sticker if all it's doing is measuring ability? This four-year slog that's extremely expensive. That's the best way that people have come up with to. To get the sticker? Uh, right. Well, there's, there's so many things to say. I mean, first of all, when you say, is that the best way we've come up with? Is the best way we've come up with given that government showers a trillion dollars a year on education? 
So it's not that it is somehow one Only out a in, some, in some fair contest. <laughs> yes. Is that, is that <laughs> a- something that was one out in a fair contest? You know, this is a very heavily subsidized way to about to evaluate worker quality. So that's the first thing to keep in mind is that government doesn't just have a hand on the scale. It has a, it has a truck on the scale in favor of the status quo. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. Uh, now, the next thing to keep in mind is uh, there are many different kinds of ability, and, and school seems to actually be weeding people out on almost all the ones you can think of. So it's not just intelligence. You know, intelligence is something, yeah, you can just give people an IQ test, something like that, and that seems like it would be a much cheaper way. But what if what you're trying to uh, you're trying to find are workers who are, you know, are, are, are hardworking and especially workers who are conformist? Now there, it's a lot easier to see, well, why does it have to be so expensive and go on for so long? Well, suppose that someone came along, look, here's a way I'm going to certify that people are hardworking, but it only takes a month. Now, who are the first people who are going to be aligned for this one-month certification? They're going to be people who aren't very hardworking, the people looking for an easy way out. But Brian, so, <laughs> but Brian, if you're arguing that the average college student is proving how hardworking he or she is, I think you got a tough test there. It's really you not. have to prove you're hardworking compared to the competition. So, you, know, you know the old the old story about two guys in the woods and they yeah. see a bear and one yeah. one starts putting on his running shoes. You just have to show that you know you're saying, you know, you can't outrun that bear. No, I just have to outrun you. Uh, that's a lot of what's going on in education. Is that you know 55 percent of people are finishing. They're showing that they are quite a bit better than the 45 percent who don't. Again, I mean, I, I will say it is puzzling. Like, why is it that people are, you know, like don't finish when they don't have to do that much work? And when you say, well, what college is showing is they weren't even willing to do the little that college asks of them. So, so that, so that is a problem. Well, I think a different, uh, uh, maybe a better answer to your for your case is that for the majors that that do pay a premium, a significant premium above the average of uh, the eighty three percent of the premium for those who graduate, there are some who really do have to work very hard. Engineering and the sciences, oh, yeah, computer yeah. science, that's, even that's, economics that's have to work pretty true. hard. Uh, right, but, but, but there's actually a more fundamental ex- answer to your question, and it says, look, not only can signals be expensive, they really have to be if there's a valuable prize at the end. So think about this. Suppose that someone came up with a chemical process to make diamonds as cheaply as plastic. How much longer would people continue to give diamond engagement rings? I say like a minute. Yeah. <laughs> right, this would be the end of it. Why? Because an engagement ring, it has to be expensive. Otherwise, it does not show point. commitment. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, so, and, and I say the same thing goes with education. If someone figured out a way to make, uh, to make the current process happen in a year, this would mean that a whole lot of people would put in the year, they'd finish, and then it wouldn't really show that much about you. It's got to be a long, drawn-out, painful process, or else it doesn't really separate you from the pack. And according to signaling well, that's, that's the key point, is to separate yourself from the pack. So the, so the easier it gets, or the, or, the, or, the more, or, the more, or the more subsidized, the more you have to do to show, hey, I am, I am at the top of the pack. Yeah, I guess the next question would be, well, you know, why isn't it six years or why isn't it three? It is interesting that, that there's – and, of course, there is some movement toward three. What The movement toward three is the uh, advanced placement phenomenon, which right. is making Although it – Although there's a lot, more, a lot more movement towards five and six. <laughs> yeah? Is that true? <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, so a lot you – know, like, you know, it is very common for students to not finish in four years. Very common. So that's, that's why these graduation report rates that when they're reported are usually like five- or six-year graduation rates for four-year programs – because so many people, even those who finish, don't actually finish on time. And of course, we've talked about this before at Econ Talk. There's a third part of college, which is uh, exploring life and finding out who you are and all that. And the um, the social part of college is a huge part, I think, of why people are willing to spend large sums of money to go, go through the experience. But going back to the signaling versus human capital argument, so I'm um, if, if playing in the armchair. When I think back to the numerous college courses uh, that I took that, that didn't change my life or don't appear to have made me more productive or more interesting or more thoughtful or whatever, um, many of them did. So, and I think that's, we can all, that, that's a silly debate, right? Uh, but I, I take your point that when you think about it, there are some majors and some classes that didn't seem to have much productive value, but we can debate that for a long time. I'm curious what evidence. Besides armchair theorizing, you would you point to that that labor economists ignore that you said was in other fields, et cetera, for the signaling yeah, theory. So, 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 yeah. So in terms of the research, one of the you know, one very well established fact that gets very little play is what's called the sheepskin effect. So I mean, we we've sort of been touching on this this point about how not you know, so starting college without finishing seems to raise earnings by only ten percent, whereas it raises earnings by 80, seems to raise earnings by eighty three percent if you do finish. Um, 
So, uh, but this is actually part of a much more general fact, which is that a lot of the payoff for, for education comes from getting your degree. It comes from crossing the finish line. Right now, uh, in the early decades of the signaling model, this fact was not yet well established. And so there was a lively debate, you know, is there a sheepskin effect? Is there not a sheepskin effect? For, for, you know, as long, until the sheepskin effect was well established, when it was still in debate, almost everyone took for granted that a large sheepskin effect would show that, that, that signaling was important. Because otherwise, why would it be so important to just get over that finish line? You know, so in, in, in terms think, of the human capital model, it's, it's really puzzling. Like, why, what is it, the last class that teaches you? The, the teaches capstone. You how, how, it's the capstone class. That's the whole idea. Yeah, the, the, the capstone class. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, you know, like, why is it the person one Aristotle class short of graduation is only is is, is getting, well, you know, only ten percent? Whereas if you just finished that class, you would get eighty three percent. Well, hang on, uh, hang yeah, on. Yeah. Two things. First of all, uh, for those who are, um, I think uh, I don't know if this is a universally understood uh, name, but a sheepskin is another word for a graduating college. Getting a sh getting your sheepskin. I don't know the origin of that. Do you know it, Brian? Uh, yes, yes, yeah, yes, I do. So it's another word for diploma, and the reason is diplomas used to be, used to be written on sheepskins, actually. Oh, which uh, which is called like I think it's is it vellum? What's there's a name for sheepskin? Some kind of yeah, there's that, another that name. Sounds that sounds right. I'm not sure I, that's right, uh, but I see what yeah, you're saying. Yeah. It's it's a form of, yeah. of ancient of ancient right. uh, paper like stuff. Um, so yes, yes. So, 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 so anyway, uh, like so. You know, but so no, as my long question as is, as long as no, my question. Know, look, look, look. Hang on, my question is: It's ten percent. You said the returns ten percent if you don't finish. Is it ten percent if you go for yeah, premium? Yeah, the premium. Uh, but, sorry, yes, premium, premium is over high school students is only ten percent if you don't graduate. Uh, that is, attending colleges makes you a little more money relative to a high school graduate. Is that true if you go for one year, two years, and three years? Because what you're claiming is. You're t you might be claiming if you go for three and a half semesters and you're one short course short of graduation, you still only get 10%. Is that true? It's a little more complicated than that. So if, if you awesome. if you go if you go and take a very close look at the data for college, you'll see something like like the first the first year of college that might increase you know as long as you successfully finish that that might increase your earnings by five to ten percent. Then year then year two maybe another five to ten percent. Year three seems to give you nothing, and then it's year four that gives you the uh, gives 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 you the remainder, which is huge. I guess the question would right? be, and we, and we see something very similar for high school as well. So you know, like you know, ninth grade seems to give you a bit, tenth grade a bit, eleventh grade seems to give you nothing at all, and then twelfth grade, finishing that, getting the diploma, that's what gives you a very big raise over what a high school dropout would earn. Yeah, I guess the complication is is that the people who do get say three and a half years into their college degree or one course short, why don't they finish? And what, what does that tell you? And I guess yeah, one answer exactly, would be exactly. Then now now you're thinking like someone who believes in signaling. Now, now you're saying, and you know, employers asking, wait, why didn't this person finish? What is wrong with that person? I mean, maybe they just had some bad luck, but also it suggests, look, you know, it, in our society, it's expected that you finish. You haven't yeah. finished. There are a lot of different ways that you could have made up whatever problems you have. So I'm nervous about you as an applicant. Uh, but just let me to, to to go back to how how the debate played out. So there was a long period when economists just weren't sure if there was a sheepskin effect or how big it was. During that period, everyone took for granted that a large sheepskin effect would show that signaling was important, and the lack one would would at least undermine that. Now, in the late '80s, early '90s, it became totally clear that there were huge sheepskin effects. Better data came along, and several papers were published, and they've never been really, and never been challenged successfully, or even, even not even challenged successfully. Only anyone's even even tried to you know, even tried to challenge them. The data, so, the data is now so clear, but almost as soon as the evidence came in very strongly that there was, that sheepskin effects were very real and very large. Let me guess. Then, then, <laughs> then labor economists, yes, moved the goalposts and said, "Well, it doesn't really prove anything." Of course not. Right, and I, yes, and and then and then they came up with some very sophisticated mathematical models where it wouldn't have to prove anything. So yes, well, yes, you can come up with a model where it doesn't prove anything, but. That doesn't mean that it doesn't. You're, you know, the, like in order to show that it doesn't, that it, in order, basically in order to say that it doesn't mean anything, you have to say, well, maybe you know, there's, there's got to be some totally unmeasurable difference between the people who just finished and the people who just don't. And I can't tell you what that thing is, and none of the things we actually measure act work, but uh, that's, 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 that's my story. Right, and just, you know, when you know when you know that these people uh, that are saying, making these arguments have been through the entire educational process, they finished at least three different degrees. You know, to be you know to be a researcher on this, you finished your high school degree, you finished your bachelor's degree, your master's, probably your PhD. 
And for people like that to say, uh, it's, I'm totally unconvinced that it matters whether you actually get your degree and cross the finish line, to me it's just insane. Like, you know very well, you were a student, you know that if you didn't finish, that would ruin your life and prevent you from, doing, from getting this job. So you know that. Everyone around you knew that. If you were to go and deny that to the fellow students and say, I'm not showing up for the final exam because what difference does it make? It makes a lot of difference. Right? And it makes a lot of difference because people who don't finish are, you know, are quite different from people who do, and employers will hold it against you. Yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, any other empirical evidence you want to cite that's relevant besides the sheepskin effect? Uh, sure. Well, so I mean, there's there's some there's some abstruse re research evidence that I could go over, but actually, I'd rather focus on some arguments that I, I, I you know, in a way, I think there should be research on them. Although, in a way, they're too simple and it's too simple and clear to get get a paper. But you know, like you know, so like here is one fact that that I that I that I that, I, that I've, uh, I've often noticed. Uh, what do students do when a professor cancels class? They they're happy, right? They cheer. <laughs> Right, uh, I mean, you know, yeah. So I said, well, you know, and and from a human capital point of view, this is bizarre. It's basically the, the professor is saying, you know, how you went and paid some tuition for me to train you to be a better worker, so you can do better in the, in, in real life. Yeah. Well, I'm going to keep your money, and I'm not going to give you the training. See ya. <laughs> that is effectively what the human capital model is saying. What happens when a professor cancels class? On the other end, you know, so the signaling model says, well, why don't the why are the students happy? Because the employers will never know that you cancel class. What they're learning, they're never going. They're probably never going to need to know again. It's not going to show up on their transcripts. Uh, if everybody do, if everybody learns less, then this is not going to change the distribution of grades in all likelihood. So then students get an after afternoon, extra afternoon off, and they are, and, it, and they, then it's not going to affect their future. I um, mean, so this is something that my you know, my 11 year old sons who are you know, fanatical about doing their homework, yet they're delighted with every snow day. They say, why are you delighted? And I say, well, it doesn't you know doesn't disadvantage us compared to anyone else. So, and they're like, well, aren't you worried about the stuff? But you're not gonna you're gonna need to know the stuff you didn't learn. And yeah, you know, even 11, they're cynical enough to go, yeah, right, like that's never gonna happen. Well, I gotta say, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, kid, kid, you have, you have, you appear deeply into the system and seen it through nature. Yeah, I, I, I fight off the urge to say, well, Brian, it's in your classes they they cheer, but in my classes they weep. <laughs> uh, but that's that's I, I'm going to leave that. I'm not going to say that. That'd yeah. be, that would be cruel. Right, or or, yeah, or here, here's another one of my uh, you know, my favorite debating points. Um, claim right now you can get the best education in the world for free if you want it. Uh, how, what am I talking about? Well, if you, if you suppose you think Princeton is the best education in the world, you don't need to apply, you don't need to get admitted. All you do is move to Princeton and start attending classes. And in my experience, no one will stop you. No one will card you. If you go to the professor and say, I'm, just, I'm not a student here, but I'm interested in your class, most professors get a tear in their eye. It's like, <laughs> someone actually wants to learn from me. Uh, but if you go and get this totally free Princeton education for four years, there's one thing you won't have at the end. Any proof you ever did it. Right, and uh, if you if you and if you consider this, you know, you know, deal A is you go to Princeton, but there's and you get a Princeton education with no record that you ever did it, or you go to a much lower ranked school where you where you admit you were getting a worse education, but there is a record. Which one is going to do more for your career? Almost everyone says, well, obviously the second one. The first one may make you an interesting person, may be a great experience, but employers aren't going to care because they won't believe you. There's no sign that you're ever there. Whereas getting a bachelor's degree by the book from Podunk State, on the other hand, that actually is that that that, that gives you, you know, not, you know, that gives you it doesn't give you nearly as much as getting a bachelor's degree from Princeton, but it gives you some, but it gives you something that is real and tangible. Yeah, but your point right? is that, that, your point is that is even is is stronger than that. You're saying that even if I could prove I was there, even if you gave me the tests that showed I understood the material. Because I didn't go through the ordeal of writing, doing the homework and writing the tests, I still wouldn't help my employment chances. And that's where it gets a little more complicated, right? Because, you know, I recently talked with uh, John Cochran about MOOCs, and we've talked with others about MOOCs here, uh, the online educational opportunities, which, which is what I thought you were going to talk about. I thought you were going to say, well, a person can get a great education for free. They can listen to Econ Talk. They can go to Udacity. <laughs> don't, oh, yeah. la don't laugh, Brian. Um, you can laugh. They can go to they can go to Udacity and take free classes it's, there. It's a fantastic education. It's just not education in the sense that the labor market cares about. There's Khan Academy. There are all these wonderful resources, and a lot of them, including Econ Talk, are trying to think about ways to help people feel better about what they've actually learned or to give them feedback on what they've learned. 
but they none of them right now give a certificate uh although uh, udacity is trying to move in that direction and some of the online courses are as well and that's going to be you know one of the challenges but the question would be if a person did not go to school did not go to university uh and instead stayed home for four years lived with their parents and took these extraordinary classes which are out there and let's say did all the work but couldn't prove it okay mm -hmm. so in certain fields I, I don't think it would matter that they didn't get the the sheepskin i think if you could say and they might have trouble getting in the door i agree with that mm -hmm. but they would have learned something literal very, very 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 useful say for example if they study computer science at many of these places now that are available online many of these classes that are available online you can you can teach yourself many of these things without going to university what's true is you can't certify that you've done that mm -hmm. and is there an is there a test that employers could give and the answer is eh, maybe maybe not it's expensive it's much easier to, to take a person with good grades who's gone through a, a standard university program. But of course, many of these people don't go to college and become very successful. They start their own businesses, et cetera. But uh, so it seems, I don't know, it just seems um, your thought experiment there seems a little, it's a little more complicated. I mean, that foot in the door remark that you made is spot on. So I've often had this argument with Tyler Cowen about signaling. He says, look, Brian, you don't know what you're talking about. I actually have a job where I have to hire people and fire people, and I know how things work. And he says, and I say, like, within three months, we know whether work is good or not. So it's crazy to think that you have to go and spend all these years signaling in order to get the other job. But I say, you know, wait a second, you're looking at this the wrong way. You know, what has to happen before you can evaluate someone for three months? You, know, you have to hire them. What has to happen before you, before you can hire them? You have to interview them. What has to happen before you interview them? You, well, you have to go and pull their application out of a giant stack of other applications. And you know, so you know, anytime someone has 300 applications for one job, what, what, what are they going to do? They're going to go and start thin and thinning it by throwing away applications from people that don't seem like they're worth giving an interview to. So if you have an unconventional transcript, an unconventional background, so maybe you just don't have any proof that you did it, or maybe it's just something weird that you did or unusual that you did. This is something where employers quite reasonably don't give you a chance because they're not in the business of giving chances. They're trying to run a business. To go and actually give every one of 300 applicants a full interview would be, would, would, would be enormously costly. So it's uh, very I'm natural that they, that, they, uh, that they actually throw most applications away before they even give the, give the person much of a chance. I'm going to give you a little more evidence on your behalf, and maybe I stole this from you or – Maybe you've already thought of it. It's hard to believe I'd have come up with something you haven't thought of, Brian, on this, because I know you think about it a lot, and you're a very clever man. I, I have a Thank lot you, of Ed. respect for you. I'm serious. I have a lot of respect for your uh, creativity, as, a, as a, especially as a debater. But here's an interesting example. Sometimes someone turns out to have lied about their qualifications for a job. Mm -hmm. they, they don't have a degree from Harvard. They didn't get a master's in such and such, and they're immediately fired. And they're not fired because they can't do the job well. They're fired because they lied, not because they're incompetent, which would seem to suggest that that the piece of paper itself is maybe not so important. Well, or, or the you – know, there, there is a reason to be concerned about having con artists in your employment, right? No, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying yeah. that yeah, – no, 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 but you know, I'm, I'm saying just as a business decision, saying, look, this guy is perfectly able to do the job, but he's a con artist. No, I would fire that person, of course. and I think it would be, it's a smart business. Decision. No, I agree, but I'm agreeing yeah. with you. I didn't say it well. What I'm saying yeah. is that that actually attending the university didn't have any impact on whether they were good at the job or not. And and not, it's not like the people say, oh, the person didn't attend this university, doesn't have the degree. Obviously, they can't do the job. They've been doing the job. So it's it's really just the piece of paper as a signal that matters. And when they're fired, not because they, they uh, don't have the skills, sure. they're fired because they were dishonest, which is fine. I understand that. But it seems to con to be consistent with your, uh, with your theory. Um, let's talk about uh, how the signaling and, and human capital models differ in terms of measuring and thinking about the return. And the thing I think is most valuable about it for me is, is forcing you to think about the role of ability, underlying ability, mm -hmm. and unobserved variables. Because I think a lot of labor economists, I like your sociological observation that we're all graduates of, of universities and therefore we we're, we're tend to be sympathetic to this idea that we were transformed by them or not just, we didn't just jump through a bunch of hoops. I, I, li I, li I like that point. But, but I think most people are, are sympathetic to the ability idea because they look at the at the excuse me at the transformational idea the human capital argument because they look at the data and look going to college makes you more productive because you make more money but your point really is that it, the people who go and don't go aren't the same which is where we started so let's come back to that and talk about how that affects how people uh measure uh the return to education why it's so important and is there anything you can do about it uh sure 
Um, so, you know, like, like during this whole conversation, we've been talking about the observed education premia. So this is just taking a look in the world and seeing uh, how, much do, how much does the average college graduate make, how much does the average high school graduate make, and then we'll suddenly say, okay, so 83% you know, advantage for the college graduate. Um, now, uh, if, you are, you know, if you are a terrible statistician, you'll then say you know, getting a college degree raises your earnings by 83%. And I, I'm actually a little bit nervous that if you went go through the transcript of our conversation, one or both of us has said that at some point, uh, just as implication. It's but tempting. It's important to realize, it's yes, tempting. Yes, it's, it's tempting, but wrong. Right? So, so and I think as I, as I was saying in the beginning, when you see that college graduates are earning 83% more, than high school graduates, you have to ask, right, so there's one thing that's different about them and that the college graduate has went to college and finished, but is that the only thing that's different about college graduates versus high school graduates? And well, of course not. So the average college graduate is going to be smarter. He's probably going to be harder working. He's probably going to be more conformist, less impulsive, have many other advantages. And that 83% is capturing all the advantages that the college graduate has, not just the, the single advantage of the education. It's capturing the benefits of a lot of advantages he had before he ever started school. So if you really want to find out how much did his education raise his earnings, you need to, to correct for or adjust for all of these initial advantages. Uh, so there is a big research literature that tries to do this in economics. Uh, if you do this the simple way, namely you just try to go and measure the pre-existing advantages and then redo the, redo the statistics, then you generally find that the true uh, education premium is a lot less than the observed one. So just just put, basically just putting in uh, or just just correcting for your me for your measured IQ before you start college. That will usually bring the payoff down by about thirty percent. So not thirty percentage points, but thirty percent. So bring it down from like from like eighty to may from like eighty to maybe fifty five, something like that. So that is one one very important adjustment. And then once you put in that adjustment, you say, well, geez, you know, there's a lot more going on than just intelligence. There's work ethic and conformity. Some of these things there aren't very good measures for. But you can still say it seems plausible that it, that it's that it's actually uh, that it's uh, that it's actually uh, other abilities that are that are accounting for for this. So in my book, after going over all of the evidence that I could find and then and just weigh, weighing it all, I say, well, my best guess is that only about 55% of the of the gain that you seem to get is genuine, and the rest uh, and the rest is what college graduates would have actually the extra amount college graduates would have actually earned if they hadn't even gone to college. So that that is my story. Um, now, now there's there's a lot of very technical statistical work that it, that actually has higher status than the research I'm talking about, where they try to say, no, 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 the 83 percent is genuine. Uh, we, you know, we we can talk about that if you want, but at least at least my view is that the the simple standard method gives the gives the obvious answer, and probably as a result, people have to, researchers have turned to a much more complicated approach that gives the answer that they're more interested in hearing, which is what you see is what you get. Let's talk about this general issue in empirical work, which is um, sometimes we're just stuck with variables that are produced by the data sets that we have access to. So, for example, one I've always found strange is years of schooling, mm -hmm. right? We I've seen lots and lots of statistical analyses that use years of schooling as a predictor of, say, income or, or something else. And, of course, a year of schooling in one place is not the same as a year of schooling somewhere else. We had Lant Pritchard on recently talking about education oh, yeah. in, in, in outside in poor countries, and it's tragic, right? A year of education, forget this human capital signaling thing. It, it, in a lot of places, and of course this is true in the United States as well, a year of schooling doesn't mean you learned anything. Um, and, it's not, and, and yet, it's, actually, if you look at earnings in countries where they have really crummy schooling systems, it seems like a year of education in those countries pays as much or as more as it does right here. Is that true? Uh, so I, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of yes. a skeptic about that, Brian. Yes. Well, tell uh, me about that. Uh, right. So there's there's been a lot of effort to measure the international return to education, look at different countries, and the sta the very standard result is that actually in poor countries that generally have, as Lant Pritchett points out, these very crummy educational systems, the payoff in the labor market of get of getting another year of education or getting more degrees seems to still be on the order of like 10 percent per year. Which again, in terms of what they're teaching them is crazy, but in terms of saying, look, people who are willing to jump through these hoops and endure this horrible process where they don't even learn anything, it still seems to say something about you as a worker, and it makes employers in those countries more willing to hire you, and you do actually get an advantage, well, even though you don't seem to be learning much of anything. Kind of skeptical about that. I guess, you know, if you're in a school, say, where the teacher doesn't show up most of the time, which is uh, one of the examples that, that Pritchard was talking about, 
you're telling me that you get a premium just for your ability to show that you can sit there? I don't know. It's it's hard to believe. Could be. Right. Well, so and you can you can really can take a look at third world countries and see that people with more education uh, you know make more money there, just like they do here. It's just, you know uh, the premiums are very similar to here, or actually a bit higher. So. Um, you, know, so, you know, I mean, again, the main thing to remember is, of course, employers don't know the details. So you might have gone to the school where the teacher never showed up, and maybe they wouldn't have considered that to be really much of a signal. But if teachers show up, say, two thirds of the time, and yours didn't show up at all, they may still be willing to give you a big pay hike because they're just playing the odds. You know, which is what all employers are doing all the time is playing the odds. You get 300 applications. You don't go and hire people based upon the truth. You do it based upon your best guess. Because well, you can't know the truth. But the other example I wanted to mention, which I think is always fascinating, is uh, it's always a debate in the economics profession over the last few years about whether the minimum wage reduces um, employment or not, and if so, by how much. And, of course, one of the challenges of that literature, which I don't think it does a very good job of dealing with, is the fact that most workers aren't affected by the minimum wage. So when you're going to trying to look at a, a country of, of hundreds, a few hundred million workers – 100 plus million workers, uh, most of them are not going to have any effect. So it's very difficult to tease out that measure. Um, and so I, it, it fascinates me to think about the challenges of actually attributing causal relationships here when it, these things are poorly measured and, and there's a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, right. So, I mean, you know, so I mean, my view is, of course, everything you're saying is true. I, I, mean, I, I still am a, am a firm believer in the view that some numbers are better than no numbers. Uh, it's better to you know, do a very stripped down, oversimplified version than to just say do whatever you want to do. I, you know, and and especially so, you know, when you start with some numbers, however crummy, then you can say, all right, so here's here's our you know here's our first product. It's a it's a, it's a beta. It's a prototype. Now, how can we improve this? So you know, like, you know, like one of the main things that I'm doing in the chapter that I'm writing right now is trying to put together all of the evidence on all the different ways that education is supposed to improve your life. And just try to you know, try to go and get a very comprehensive list of like everything anybody's ever said, anything that seems plausible, put it all in. Um, now, like like, are there going to be problems with this estimate? Yeah, I mean, like like basically at every single stage, there's a problem. Uh, but still, just to get a ballpark idea about what's going on, I mean, I mean, when I think about hiring a contractor, the contractors are never are, that I wouldn't, that I absolutely never hire the ones when I say how long will it take, and they say I can't tell you. Those people have no chance in my book. Someone who says like maybe six weeks. Those people have, you know, have a chance in my book. At least they're giving me some kind of a number. I mean, we all know it's not the exact truth, but at least be willing to stick their necks out and give and say and tell me something, uh, you know, something I can work with. That's where I can say, you know, all right, so you're like what you're like way over what you said you were going to do, or if you know if there's a delay, say, well, yeah, I mean, I can understand a delay of a week, but why are you delayed by three weeks? You know, like it's taken nine weeks. It should be maybe, maybe seven based upon the guy who worked for you being sick for a week. So what's up with that? Uh, so, you know, I mean, I, like, like, I, I would always rather have, you know, some evidence rather rather than no evidence and then just try to do the best we can. And, yeah, then, you know, you know, and then at the end, you know, also, you know, like, I think it's always fine to say, like, let's, let's like, so here's like a fudge factor. You know, so if we go and correct for every ability we can measure, we see that the payoff for education seems to go down by 35%. Well, what about all the stuff we haven't put in? Uh, I don't know, maybe that's maybe that changes it to like forty five percent, you know, something like that. Just you know, just seeing if all the stuff that we can think of and measure easily brings the return down by thirty or thirty five percent. Then if we then if we were to go and tack on the other stuff that we haven't seen, forty five percent sounds good. And again, like is that uh, you know is is that like a, a hard fact? No, it's just a reasonable judgment that reasonable people will make. Yeah, I don't disagree with you, by the way. I, I don't think uh, – I have no problem with the idea of arguing that some data is better than none uh, as long as it's relevant. And I, I, I'm, I'm, my only – my general skepticism is toward uh, sophisticated empirical work, mm -hmm. which, meaning multiple regression analysis, which struggles, I think, to prove anything that's reliable. I, I find often – and I think what's fascinating, your example is a good example, right? Here you have all this evidence that should have convinced all these labor economists that it hasn't either – they have a terrible confirmation bias problem, which I'm willing to entertain, or you do, right? And the inter and the ed and the information is not quite as decisive as it appears to you. Um, I like your point, though, which I think is extremely relevant, which is that, and I, we'd have you'd have to document it to make it strong. Which is, well, gee, before the evidence came out, they did seem to say that they it wouldn't be found. So when they did find it, they should have had some adjustment of their priors, but. That's hard for people, so that's probably confirmation bias. 
Mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean, to me, like, what, what is most impressive is that when I actually talk to people who officially don't believe in signaling, their actual experiences are so similar to mine and so similar to those, uh, so similar to what the signaling model would predict. So I was talking with one very, very eminent labor economist about uh, his experience as an, as, 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 a, as, a, as, a, as a bank apprentice in Germany. And I was saying, so did you consider just going on and being a banker? He said, no, you have to get college for that. <laughs> and, he, and he actually laughed at his own sentence because he realized that what he was saying fit with my story so much better than his. And yet that was his spontaneous reaction to what he saw with his own eyes. 